If you're just joining us um, today or if you're just now tuning in, um, we are honored to have you with us. And my name is Brandon Caudill, Director of Family Ministries here at First Baptist Mount Healthy. And it's an amazing privilege again to stand to preach God's Word and to share with you today. And we are in week five of our series that we have called A Thrill of Hope, and we are studying our way bit by bit, chapter by chapter, through the book of Zechariah. And we're doing this because we believe that one of the chief needs of the people of God today, of you, of me, um, is we need to be encouraged. We need to have some hope in the times that we are living through. And the book of Zechariah is a good place to look for that because the chief theme that runs throughout the book is one of encouragement and one of hope. And if we are going to live for Jesus here in our city of Cincinnati, here in our community of Mount Healthy, uh, if we are going to serve Jesus in a church like First Baptist Mount Healthy, then there is a need for the Holy Spirit to lift us up, to stir us up, to encourage us, and spur us onward. Amen? We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be um, an impact in our city. And so that's the reason we are studying the book of Zechariah. Encouragement and hope are primary themes that run throughout that text. And so God showed Zechariah these eight visions. If you recall, over the last five weeks, we've been studying through what is commonly called the night visions uh, from Zechariah. And uh, we are coming today to visions number six and visions number seven. And just like the other visions, there's a lot of symbolic language, a lot of stuff that we're going to wrestle with today and dig into. And so we come to Zechariah chapter five today and we find those visions. And I want us to see see here that it is God that gives hope by unveiling how he is going to deal with sin. That's what we're looking at today. It's on the surface, I was talking to to Ken about this as we have been preparing these sermons and stuff. We've been kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. And he checked in with me earlier this week and he was like, I'm praying for you, um, (laughs) preparing for this week because that's a tough passage. I was like, yeah, I know, right? Like, uh, why couldn't I, like, pick up on chapter 6 when things kind of get a little more cheery and a little little less serious? Um, but we're going to see today that God reveals how he is going to ultimately deal with the sins of his people, and we are going to find hope and encouragement in that. I want us to see that from a curse comes hope. That's the title of today's message. So you may be asking yourself, how does that bring hope? You might be thinking, why should I be hopeful because God judges sin, Brandon? Like, where do you find hope in judgment? Where is hope in wrath? Where is that encouraging to me? Why should this make me hopeful? It's for this reason right here. Because our chief means of hope and encouragement for me and for you is to be reminded of what Jesus Christ has done for sinners such as us. If you want hope, look no further than what Jesus did on the cross to reconcile us back to a holy God. That is where we can find our hope. As followers of Jesus, we've got to see that we are never more hopeful, we are never more encouraged than when in the power of the Holy Spirit, we meditate upon and celebrate the victory, the reconciliation and redemption, the adoption as orphans who had no place in the family of God. We were adopted into his family through what Jesus did for us. So let's seriously consider this tough passage for a few moments this morning. Let's meditate together, dwell upon together the truth of the gospel that Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. If you walk away with nothing else today, hang on to that little tidbit of truth because that will radically change your life. Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. And for our hope and for God's glory, what I want to do today is consider this fifth chapter of Zechariah, consider what it can teach us about how God deals with sin and how we can find hope in that. So we're going to look and see three things. So here's your roadmap. If you're a note taker, we're going to look at three things today. We're going to look at God curses our sin. 
We're going to look at how God covers our sin. And number three, we'll look at how God carries our sin. So there you go in good Baptist fashion. You got your three points with the alliteration. God curses, he covers, and carries our sin. But before we dive into the truth of God's word and begin to tackle this passage, we don't want to handle something so holy with calloused hands. We want to pray and make sure our hearts are right before we do this. So before we dive in, before we get to work, I ask you to please just bow with me for a moment and let us pray that God would have his way in our hearts today. God, thank you again for your word. God, even the tough passages like we're about to tackle today, God, we're thankful for them. Even the ones that we have to wrestle with to, to see hope in them. God, we know that held within every verse of Scripture is a roadmap to your son, Jesus. And so today, God, I pray that we would see Jesus high and lifted up in your word, in this chapter from Zechariah. God, I pray that you would be moving and active among us today, those who are remote and tuned in via Facebook. God, I pray that you would also be with them because, God, we serve you, and you are a God who is everywhere. You are omnipresent. Even here with us today, even with those who are gathered remotely, we praise you. And God, I pray that if there's anybody that is listening today, whether they're here, whether they're online, wherever they might be, even if they're listening, listening to this later, I pray, God, that they would come to know you if they don't already know you. And if they do know you, God, I pray that they would be encouraged and lifted up by the truth of the gospel that you, Jesus, have paid our sin debt. And God, may that radically transform our lives today. So help us, God, to focus upon you. What we know not, please teach us. And what we are not, God, we beg you to please make us. And it's in Jesus' name we ask and pray these things. Amen. So Zechariah 5, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to look at God curses our sin. So look with me at verse 1 through 4. Verses 1 through 4, Zechariah chapter 5. And here we go. Zechariah writes, Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, okay, the angel said to Zechariah, What do you see? And Zechariah says, I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and its width 10 cubits. We'll define cubits in a moment. Verse 3 says, he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. Your translation might say the whole earth. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. So thus far in our study of Zechariah, we have seen an incredible outpouring of God's grace upon his people that returned from exile. They returned from exile in a sinful foreign land of Babylon back to Jerusalem. And at this point, remember, they had been back 16 to 18 years, somewhere around in there. And they had basically were on fire the first two years they were there. And then things got hard for them. And they, they quit rebuilding the temple. They quit rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. And so for the last 16 years or so, they have just sat idly by and not done what God had called them back to do. And if you remember, the prophet Haggai is proph prophesying at the same time as Zechariah. Haggai really helps to kickstart the rebuilding of the temple. And then here comes Zechariah fanning that flame that God had set ablaze in his people to rebuild the temple. And so we see that God has encouraged them over and over again in these first few visions that we've looked at over the first four chapters. And we have seen grace upon grace and encouragement upon encouragement to his people. He's promised that he's going to seek justice for his people against their enemies. He's promised that he is going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And he has promised, this is probably the, the, the most significant promise, that he himself, 
the Lord is going to be with his people again. He says he will dwell among his people again. But the reality, of course, is that God did not just want to restore a community of people in a city. He wasn't just interested in repopulating the city of Jerusalem so that there would be people there. What God wanted to do was far greater, is what we're going to see today. Instead, he wanted to restore a community that was seeking holiness, a community that was seeking godliness, a community and a people that were seeking purity. So in the sixth vision recorded for us here in Zechariah 5, especially looking at 1 through 4, the prophet sees this flying scroll. Of course, we all know what a scroll is, right? You've, you unroll it, and that's the chief means of how the people of Israel and people uh, of that time period in history, they would have their, their, their things, their histories, their religious texts, everything written on these scrolls. And so Zechariah sees this flying scroll, which represents God's judgment and curse upon sin. That's what we see in the first four verses here. Now, I want us to see there are three things here, three kind of little subpoints in relation to this curse, okay? There is the criteria for the curse, there's the completeness of the curse, and then there's the certainty of the curse. So verses one and two, the criteria, Zechariah, he says, again, I lifted my eyes and saw and behold a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and it's width 10 cubits. So unfurled, unrolled, this giant scroll would look like a giant flag flying over the land. The Hebrew text describes it as 20 cubits by 10 cubits wide. Um, and as we see, like that's, that's around 30 feet long, okay, in our standard measuring units, 30 feet by 15 feet wide. Okay, so it's pretty significant. It's pretty big. And this enormous scroll is flying over the entire land. Your translation might say the entire world, which I think is a better rendering of the original language. This is all-encompassing. Okay, this isn't just for the people of Israel. It is chiefly in the context to them, but ultimately through prophecy and through everything else, it's for the world through Jesus. And so there's really nowhere anyone can hide from this scroll that is flying. And a good way to imagine the flying scroll is to think about um, an advertising banner that you might see behind an airplane. You know, you're hanging out at the beach. You're down in Florida. Things are good. You see the plane fly by and it says, rent jet skis here. <laughs> you know, like the, the, the big banner behind it. Or maybe you've seen that at a ball game before. Uh, just an advertisement behind an airplane. That's a good way to kind of think about this flying scroll over the land. It was huge. It was impossible to ignore. And written all over it, according to verse 3, are the curses of God against sin. That's what we see there. And so what is the criteria for God's curse upon sin? Well, I think that we can conclude that it is the word of God. That's what this scroll is signifying for us. You see, according to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it is the word of God that is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. That's the word. In Romans 2, 1 through 2, Paul, he writes, Therefore, every one of you who judges is without excuse. For when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things. Listen to this, verse 2. Now we know that God's judgment on those who do such things is based on what? It's based on truth. And what is truth? I think Jesus answered that question for us in John 17, 17, when he prayed to the Father, your word is truth. And then in John 5, 24, Jesus Again, he is stressing the importance of heeding the truth of God's word. He's talking to his disciples there. And he says, truly, truly, I say unto you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So if we interpret scripture with scripture, we see that in other words, what Jesus is saying, judgment is based upon hearing and believing God's word. Word. That's the criteria. You see, each of us 
will be put up against the perfection of the Word of God. And if we have violated it, and newsflash, all of us have, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all guilty of violating God's Word. And if we have rejected Jesus as the only sacrifice for sin, like so many people have, then we will be judged. So the criteria for God's curse upon sin is his word. That's, that's where we see the criteria for it. So the completeness of the curse, that's verse 3. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land, the face of the whole world. And then you see that he uses language here like everyone. And it says cleaned out in the ESV. Your translation might say cut off. Like these, this, this is language of completeness. And there's no gray area here. It's, it's pretty black and white. You are either in or you are out. There is no in between. And notice what is written on the scroll. Let's look at what God has written on it. On one side, the scroll describes thievery and the fate of thieves, those who steal. On the other side, it describes swearing falsely or taking the Lord's name in vain, making a, a swear with the Lord's name and the fate of those who do such a thing. And so for those of you keeping count, keeping score, that is number three and number eight on the list of the Big Ten Commandments. Now, why did God choose those two commandments? Because Jesus said that we are to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That's how Jesus boiled it down, right? Well, we see something very similar here in Zechariah. We see that God chose to, to use these two commandments, the, the third commandment and the eighth commandment. And we must ask ourselves, why is that? Well, Bible commentator Warren Wiersbe, in his book, Be Heroic, he wrote this. The third commandment is the central commandment on the first tablet of the law. Okay, so remember back to Exodus, Moses had two tablets, and we had five on one and five on the other. So Wiersbe says that the eighth commandment is the central commandment to the second tablet of the law. So these two commandments represent the whole law. So in other words, they represent our relationships, okay, watch this, to both God vertically and people horizontally. God is number three. We don't take his name in vain. We don't swear falsely, right? That's our relationship to God. And then stealing would be a sin against our brother, a sin against our neighbor, a sin against our sister. So they represent God's complete law. I find that very interesting. And also, if you look at the end of verse four, you will see the complete destruction complete and utter destruction of those who are guilty of breaking his law. Okay? Zechariah writes that not only will lawbreakers be cut off and cursed, but even the timber and stones of their very homes will be consumed by his judgment, completely annihilated. Do you see the completeness here of this curse? You might be thinking, this is really bleak. Where's hope in this? Well, hang on, let's look at the certainty of the curse. Verse 4, God says, I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts. Right? Do you see that? Notice that God declares he will be the one to do it. That's pretty certain. It's not an angel. It's not a prophet. It's not a man. It is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's armies himself that will send out this curse, this judgment. So friends, when God says he's going to do something, he means it. We can take that to the bank. His word is truth, and the certainty of God's curse against sin should not be doubted. So friends, listen. What we see here is God's calling for an all-encompassing, a holistic, widespread godliness among his people. It's a calling for real holiness. And this is a huge call from the Lord, right? I mean, we have to ask ourselves, what about us? How does this impact us today as people who live here in Cincinnati who worship at First Baptist Church Mount Healthy? We have been called to be a light to the world. And 
Do you see how crucial living in holiness and living in godliness is to the success of that calling? The 19th century Scottish preacher, Robert Murray McShane, we did the McShane reading plan last year for 2020, the year of the Bible. Here's what McShane famously prayed. Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. Make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. That should be our personal prayer today too, for you and for me. You see, for our testimony of Jesus to be powerful, to actually have some meat to it, for that testimony to be powerful in this world of sin, it must be accompanied by our personal holiness and godliness. Because without it, it's just words. It's not life change. It's not representative of something that people want. Because people aren't interested in something that does not bring transformation. If we look no different than the world, then those without Christ ask, what's the use then? What can Jesus do for me? If you're, you're just as bad as me, there's nothing different about you. What's the use? Friend, listen. It is only in Jesus Christ that one can meet that holy standard. Through the power of the Holy Spirit transforming our heart, making us born again, and helping us to live out this holy calling. It's only through aligning ourselves by faith to Christ's perfect obedience, his perfection, that we can become holy. And we can draw near to him through the power of the Holy Spirit. This isn't just you get up and you do all the right behaviors and you check off your list. It's not about behavior modification. It's about life transformation. And if you want life transformation, it's not about keeping the rules. It's about drawing near to Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit and having that power in your life to help you have that holiness and godliness to accompany your testimony to the world so that people will see that Jesus can change their life. So Jesus Christ is the only one that can meet that standard. It's only in him that we can avoid the curse and judgment that we read of here. He has provided holiness for us in Christ Jesus. God curses our sin, but do you see the hope that we have there? If not, maybe consider point two with me. God covers our sin. Verses five through eight. Read with me here. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And I said, what is it? He said, this is the basket that is going out. Okay, so we've got a scroll. Now we've got a basket. All right, let's see what this is. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. Iniquity is immorality, sin, right? Verse seven, and behold, the leaden cover was lifted And there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. So what is this, right? As we move into the second vision here in chapter 5, we can see, okay, that it shares a lot of common ground with an earlier vision that Ken preached on a couple of weeks ago. If you'll remember all the way back to Zechariah chapter 3, we saw Joshua, the high priest, exchange his filthy robes for pure robes. If you remember that vision. That vision and this vision of the basket with the woman inside with iniquity really seem to speak of the inadequacy of the Old Testament sacrificial system. Okay, because it was merely a shadow, as Hebrew says, of greater things to come in Christ. So in both of these visions, the one in chapter 3 and then this one here with the basket, they seem to be pointing to a time, okay, where God is going to deal much more fully with his people's sin. Okay, it's, it's going to be more than just sacrificing animals at a temple. It's going to be so much more than that. It's going to, it's going to be enough to, to save the entire world if they would just believe. So in verse 6, Zechariah sees a basket. Okay, this is also known as an ipa. It's, it's a common basket that was a measuring basket um, that would have been common to the Jewish people at the time. And normally they're pretty small. Um, And although there's no defined measurements for this basket like there was for the scroll, I think we can conclude that it's a fairly large measuring basket because verse 7 indicates there was a woman sitting in the basket. Now what is, is this? 
what is the meaning of this picture before us? According to verse 8, the woman represents wickedness. It doesn't give us any indication why God chose a woman to personify this, okay? So we shouldn't overlay thoughts and, and, and opinions on top of that. But what we should look at is that it is iniquity literally being personified in this picture. It's sin being personified. And why she is being kept in the basket, why, why is she being kept in a basket with a heavy covering? Like what is all that about, this leaden covering? Well, to answer this, I want you to just come with me on a field trip, on a journey in your mind, and let's go and, and try to see and visualize the Old Testament temple for a moment. Okay? If you know anything about the temple, imagine that we go into the temple and we go into the courts. Okay? We, we, we make our way into the temple proper and there we see the Holy of Holies. There's the altar, right? And, and we see the veil, this huge, heavy curtain. And we push that aside and we find ourselves in the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And there in the Holy of Holies, is the Ark of the Covenant, right? And it's got this big, heavy cover that sits atop the Ark, known as the Mercy Seat. And so in a manner of speaking, the Mercy Seat concealed the Lord's view of the ever-condemning judgment of the law upon his people, even though he knew that, but in a manner, it, it covered that sin. And so... Each year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled blood, the blood from the sacrifice, on the mercy seat. This is how they absolved themselves of their sin. And so this proclaimed that it was only through the offering of blood that the condemnations and violations of the law could be covered. This is the Old Testament sacrificial system. Now when you turn your mind back to Zechariah chapter 5, what we're dealing with today. Do you now see some of the shadows here? Do you not see some of the pictures of that sacrificial system here? It's a, it's a shadow. It's a, there's, there's just an impression of it here. What we've got is that which condemns, right? We've got sin, iniquity, in a basket. And how is it contained? It's contained by a heavy leaden cover, right? Do you see what Zechariah chapter 5 anticipates here? There's anticipation of something that is to come. Do you see what it points to for us? Remember the words of the Apostle Paul. He wrote in Romans 3.25. He says that the cross of Christ, through the cross of Christ, God presented his son as a propitiation, as a sacrifice, as a mercy seat for us. He presented his son as a covering for our sins. Do you not see the cross of Jesus Christ here? Zechariah chapter 5, we see that at the cross this actually happened through a struggle, through his own blood, through his death. Jesus contained and pushed down our sin himself by his own body, by his own blood. He has become the blood-soaked cover over our sin over our iniquity. He is our mercy seat. Do you not see that? Christ, the cross, he covered your sin. And I think when we see Zechariah chapter five properly, what it's all about, it's absolutely marvelous, isn't it? We see the cross, we see Jesus here in the Old Testament. And in the first vision we looked at today, we saw that God curses our sin. And if we just left it there, that would be very hopeless. Very discouraging. But we see here in the second vision, praise God, that he has dealt with the curse and covered our sin. And then finally, God carries our sin. Verses 9 through 11. Here's what Zechariah writes. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. 
So if you had a problem with a woman personifying sin, we see women flying in to kind of save the day here. God uses this beautiful picture. Verse nine shows us that two unidentified women with wings, like those of a stork, they pick up the basket containing the woman who personifies sin and they carry it away. Now two clues here in our text, two verbal clues indicate that these winged women are God's servants. Okay, let's look at this. First, the women are said to have the wind in their wings. Now, the idea is that the women were carried by the wind. They were carried along. The wind helped them in their flight to carry the heavy basket of sin away. And the idea here, this this word wind is the same Hebrew word associated with God's spirit uses the same Hebrew word. Remember back in chapter four last week, God says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Okay, that same idea, the wind, the spirit of God carrying them along. And the wind is also an instrument in God's hand. Psalm 1044 speaks of the Lord making the winds his messengers. So the wind here is a tool for God. And further, the wings are said to be like those of a stork. And interestingly enough, the Hebrew word for stork is closely related to another word that can mean loyalty, which may suggest loyalty to God on the part of these creatures that remove evil from God's people. It's a lot of beautiful picture here in this symbolic language. So the the winged women, they carry the basket through the air to Shinar. Now Shinar, if you're familiar with your Old Testament back in the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11, 1 through 9, Shinar is also Babylon, okay? When you see Shinar, it's synonymous with Babylon. And that's where the basket is placed on a pedestal in a shrine there is what the vision tells us. And the idea is that wickedness, which is so offensive to the holiness of God— In the promised land, it has a home and a place of honor in Babylon where sin and wickedness run rampant. So the Bible mentions Babylon in the Genesis account, as I've already mentioned, as the, where the Tower of Babel occurs, the land of Shinar. It's, it also represents sin, idolatry, rebellion, and wickedness. And we see that from its earliest appearance in Scripture, Babylon represents a system— okay, that is proudly opposed to the holiness of God. It's a system that is God-hating. It's a system that has no place for God in it. And the book of Revelation contains a prophecy equating Babylon in the last days with a religious and a political um, a, a political world system based on rebellion against God. If you look at Revelation 17 and 18, you see more prophecy there. So from the very beginning in the Bible, To the very end, Babylon or Shinar signifies sin. So it makes perfect sense that God is carrying sin from his place of perfection to this place of sin and wickedness. And so this vision communicates a clear message. God was promising to take the guilt. He was promising to take iniquity and wickedness from his people and carry it away from his presence in Jerusalem. And he was promising that by his own initiative— right? Through his wind to remove the people's sin from his presence and confine it to its natural habitat in Babylon. That's what he says. He is banishing sin. He is getting it out of his people and out of his presence. So do you see what's being said here? Do you see that this iniquity is carried off by God's wings of grace? Do you not see the grace here? Do you see the message that God is bringing through Zechariah to his people? He's saying here, I will do it. I will carry it all away. I will take it from you and I will put it and banish it to where it belongs. I will deal with the sin. I will carry it away on my wings of grace. So yes, there is a curse. There's absolutely a curse against our sin, but from the curse comes hope. Do you see that today? From the curse comes hope. Friends, this is all pointing to Calvary and to what Christ would do for us as he would cover our sin through his blood. What he did on the cross as he would take our iniquity 
upon himself and carry it away, carry it out of the community, much like the Old Testament scapegoat. In the Old Testament, we see the scapegoat would have the sins of the people laid upon its head, you know, symbolically, and then it would be drug out of the community, symbolizing that the sin had been removed from the community for that year, for that time, until the next day of atonement when they had to do it again. But praise God, we don't have to rely upon a scapegoat today. We have the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the one who takes our sin. He's the one who carries it away. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus has borne your sin. If you trust in him, your sins are completely forgiven and you don't have to fear or worry about that. John the Baptist, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christ takes it away forevermore if your hope is in him. So what we've seen here today is that God says there's a curse for our sin. But we've also seen that he will provide the holiness, that he will provide the godliness to cover that sin. And he also provides the wings of grace to carry it all away if we just give it to him. That leaves only a couple of questions for us. Is your sin covered by Christ? Is your sin covered by Christ? Has it been carried out of the sight of a holy God? Where do you stand today with Jesus? If you can answer to those questions, yes, yes, God has covered my sin. I've placed my faith in Jesus. If you can say yes to that, rejoice in that. Find your hope and encouragement in that. Even in the bleak, dark times, that is where your hope and where your encouragement will always come from. Because Jesus dealt with your greatest need 2,000 years ago outside the city walls of Jerusalem when he was nailed to a cross. You can find your hope in that at any time. Remember what he has done for you. He knows what's going on in your life if you're struggling today. He knows what's going on. He knows how to handle that. He has already taken care of your sin. He will be with you in those dark times. He has saved you and you are precious to him no matter the circumstances you may face. So have your hope in that today. And if you're here or if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus, you have not been born again. My question is, what is keeping you from coming to him? What's keeping you from that? Don't white knuckle it anymore. Let go and go to Jesus. Apart from him, you are cursed. We have seen that today. That's not the most encouraging thing to hear, that you are cursed. But what you have heard is what what God didn't have to do. You see, God is holy. He has to curse sin. He has to condemn sin because he is holiness. But what he didn't have to do was shed his grace upon us through Jesus. So what's keeping you from coming to him? He stands ready to cover you with his perfection today, to carry your sins away. So from this curse comes your hope, friend, if you don't know Jesus. You may be at the end of your rope asking the same question, why? Why are things happening in my life that I don't understand? Why are things so hard for me right now? If you spend all your time asking why, it will never be enough. So your first step to hope begins with Jesus if you don't know him. And if you do know him, all your other steps that follow also begin with Jesus. He can transform your life here today if you will let him. What's keeping you from that? Look to him today because God, yes, curses our sin, but he covers it and he carries it away. And we can find our hope and encouragement in that. So let's pray. God, thank you again for your word and for the encouragement that we can find from it. Even in difficult passages that can be hard to understand, that can be hard to interpret, and hard to see how it even applies to our life today. God, I pray that you would continue to help us and help us to see how you can change our lives, God. If we know you, God, I pray that you would encourage us once again with the truth of the gospel that you have covered our sins, that you have provided that full atonement that was needed for us to have forgiveness and a relationship with you through your son. 
God, help us to rejoice in the gospel. Help us to rejoice in the fact that you have covered our sin and carried it away. And for those who are here today or those who might be watching who do not know you, God, I plead with you. I plead with you, God, that you would convict their hearts, that you would help them to repent of their sin and help them to see the hope that you have provided, that from a curse comes your hope. And God, I pray that you would be glorified in that. I pray, God, that people would come to a saving knowledge of you today. And I pray that you would be glorified in all the things that happen there. God, we thank you. We praise you and we love you, even in the hard times, because we know that you are good and your love endures forever. It's in Jesus' name we ask and pray these things. Amen.